And here we are with our final panel of the day, final panel of the 2023 AGM. So, I'm pleased to introduce Karen Proud. Karen is president of Fertilizer Canada and she will be our panel moderator. Duke Paul wants me to start calling people out, but I, I won't do that. <laughs> uh, also, we have Tom Rosser, and Tom is the Assistant Deputy Minister at AAFC. And we have Sukhpal Ball, President of the BC Cherry Association. And we're going to hear their perspectives on the current landscape confronting Canadian agriculture. And they're going to share their insights on the challenges and opportunities on the horizon. So please join me in welcoming our panel. I'll start, yeah. Thanks a lot, Mary. Thanks, uh, thanks everyone. I know it's tough, last panel of the last day. So thank you very, very much for being here, staying here. I know we're standing in between you and some food and some beverages, so um, we'll, uh, we'll try and make this interesting. I wish I had the, the Sean ability to put up my hands and get everybody to clap, but... Uh, <laughs> Thanks for that. We won't we won't take pauses in between for that, but uh, but do appreciate that uh, that you're willing to keep going. Um, so as Mary said, I'm uh, Karen Proud. I'm the president and CEO of Fertilizer Canada. I've only been with Fertilizer Canada. It's just about two years now, and and so. Um, when I was asked to speak on the panel about sort of the state of agriculture in the future, I don't feel qualified at all to do that, but I can certainly talk about fertilizer and, and so very happy to do that. Um, we were thrilled to be able to sponsor this panel at Fertilizer Canada. Our relationship with the Canadian Federation of Agriculture is so important to, to us. Uh, you've been a tremendous partner. Um, we really enjoy working uh, directly with, uh, with those who, who are the customers of, of our members. And so it was easy to say yes when we were approached to sponsor this, uh, this panel and, and um, really happy to do so. I met Mary fairly early on when I started a couple of years ago and, and sad to see that this is um, also Mary's last, uh, last time as, as president of CFA, but really, really looking forward to, to working with, uh, with Keith. So on today's panel, I'm actually wearing two hats. I am both the moderator as well as a panelist, so that means I get to ask myself questions, and so I get to filter what I ask myself, and then I get to ask my panelists uh, all the tough questions. Um, so that worked out really, really well for me. Um, as, uh, as Mary mentioned, I am joined uh, by, by two uh, esteemed panelists on stage. Um, first, uh, we have Sukhpal Bal. Uh, the president of the BC Cherry Association and a cherry producer whose family has been in the business for 100 years. And maybe Sukhpal can tell us a little more about that spinach that uh, the Prime Minister uh, mentioned yesterday. I'm certainly intrigued about that. Um, we also have Tom Rosser, and I'm sure to most of you in, in the room, Tom really doesn't need much of, a, of an introduction. Um, Tom is the Assistant Deputy Minister for Market and Industry Services Branch of Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. Um, Tom's got a wide view of the agricultural sector uh, in that role, and so I think um, should help to, to really provide a lot of insights um, today. I think we can agree that um, we're really at a pretty pivotal moment in agriculture. We've heard from all the panelists over the last uh, two days how important this sector is to not only Canada, but to food security, to the economy. Um, and so I think there's, um, there's a lot to talk about, uh, about those challenges and opportunities. And so this panel is really kind of the tip of the iceberg on, on some of that, but maybe get some, some folks thinking and, and hopefully uh, a, a really uh, great discussion today. 
So you're going to hear from each of us, uh, including myself, shortly. Uh, we're, we've decided as we got together to talk about this panel, we want to keep it casual. So uh, we're each going to sort of raise um, our, our points about some of the opportunities and challenging, challenges facing the sector. And then we're going to open things up to, um, to conversation um, and to some questions, I hope, uh, from, from the group. So um, each of us will provide about 10 minutes of just opening remarks. Uh, then we'll do a bit of a Q&A. There's a couple of microphones uh, that you can uh, access along the, the center alley here. We'd ask just that you introduce yourselves if asking questions your name and, and where you're from and any other interesting antidote you'd want to uh, provide to us. Uh, we do have until 4.45 today, so uh, we'll keep it going as long as you've got questions. Um, but uh, uh, recognizing that um, we are the last panel of the day, so we'll see how things uh, how things go. So I'm going to go sit down now, and then I'm going to pass it over to Sue Paul, who's going to start with uh, some comments. So I'll take that hat off, and, and I'll put this one on. Thanks, Karen. Uh, pleasure to be on this panel with, uh, with yourself and Tom. Um, I guess I'll start with the spinach story, because uh, every, everybody's <laughs> quite, quite interested. So. Uh, uh, I, uh, the, he's the prime minister now, but back when he visited our farm in Kelowna, he was uh, running for the, uh, the liberal uh, leadership. So uh, uh, we, uh, somebody reached out to my father and said, oh, um, uh, Justin is, uh, is coming to the Okanagan, uh, would you host him? And my dad said, no, no problem. And uh, so we, uh, we have an agritourism facility, uh, a small cafe, coffee shop, uh, fruit stand, and a bed and breakfast. So, so at, the, at the cafe, uh, we had dinner, and, and my mom made this uh, sog dish, uh, a recipe from, from her mother, and, uh, and uh, he very much enjoyed it. Uh, and it was uh, you know, very interesting and, and uh, uh, surprising, actually, that he, he remember, remembered that. So, so that's the, um, and, and yeah, the, and very accurately, he, he did explain the, the story about the, uh, the seed. So my great-grandfather, when he did come to, uh, to the Okanagan, had that seed originally from India, and any any time we do a new cherry planting or or we're tilling the fields there, uh, the, we see the the sog growing growing in the orchard. So, so that's the uh, that's the 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 uh, 2023 CFA spinach uh, sog story for everybody to to, to hear. Uh, so. Um, yeah, we, we, we want to keep this pretty, uh, pretty casual, I think. Uh, uh, I, I really enjoy talking to, to fellow farmers, and uh, it's, uh, that's, that's my, uh, what I take from these events, is, is connecting and, and hearing, hearing what's going on in different regions, learning, learning about uh, agriculture in, in all, uh, all parts of, uh, from all parts of Canada. So, uh, so sweet cherries. Now, I'm thinking that maybe this is a, a CFA uh, first, having a cherry, a cherry producer speak. Maybe, maybe it's happened in the past, but it's, it's not, a, uh, not a, a large industry by any means. It, we're, we're predominantly in, in, the, in the Okanagan Valley and then also in the, in the Creston Valley in the, uh, in the Kootenays. So uh, to com compare the size, we're you know around 6,000 acres of, of cherries. Our, our neighbor, Washington State, they're they're probably pushing 60,000 acres of, of cherries. So it's a it's a very um, a, a high value crop, but then also very very uh, very finicky, very sensitive. Uh, so that when when we were discussing uh, you know the, the topic for this panel, when when it was said oh the uh, the uh, you know uh, challenges we're facing. Cherry growers uh, and people in, in delicate fruits have definitely uh, been been experiencing, uh, you know, yeah, uh, tremendous amounts of challenges. So the, um, you know, just to, just to name a, a few of the events. Uh, and as I reflect on these last four or so uh, seasons, uh, 2019 we experienced, uh, you know, excessive rain in July. And and for those of you that don't that don't know, uh, sweet cherries rain landing on the fruit can be absorbed by the fruit, and then it just uh, splits and is unmarkable, it cracks. So a simple uh, a rain event at the wrong time can, can ruin our crop. So then you'll, you'll get to, what, when you're hearing what I'm saying, you'll get to realize why not too many people are cherry growers. So what we'll, what we'll do is we'll hire helicopters 
and helicopters will hover over the canopy of the orchard to dry off the, the water uh, to try to say, save those cherries. Uh, there'll be um, uh, tractors with blowers on there as well, uh, some wind machines that can be used for frost protection, but we, uh, we throw everything we can at, uh, at it to, to try to get that crop uh, to market. So back in 2019, the, uh, the uh, few days of rain we saw in the forecast, we brought a helicopter to the farm and, and, and thought, okay, this should be good, we'll get it through this uh, patch of a few days of rain. Well, those three days uh, turned into three and a half weeks of, uh, of, of rain event after rain event. At that time, we just thought it was a rainy, rainy, a bit of a rainy season. But then when you add 2020, uh, polar vortex bringing cold temperatures that we hadn't seen uh, for extended period of time. 2021, the heat dome that we experienced. Uh, and then the heat dome not only damaged the crop that was on the trees, next year's crop was also forming. So, so there's a lot, of, uh, a, a lot of damage all happening at once and, and to really extreme, extreme levels. Um, we weren't impacted by this uh, specific event, the atmospheric rivers that was in the Fraser Valley. I'm sure many of you saw that on, on the news, uh, but, but that's another example of, of how extreme and intense the, the weather has become and crops such as you know, soft fruits, they, um, they definitely take, take the brunt of it. The, uh, so what happened last year? Spring frost got us pretty bad. So the uh, and our neighbors to the south, I, I'd never seen this before, their cherries were in full bloom and they had six inches of snow on their trees. You know, so it, it's just, you know, things we've just never seen before. So what is that, uh, what, what, I, what comes across my mind often now is, is really the, the uh, viability uh, of, of some of our, our practices or our, our industry in general to, to be a farmer. I, I kind of say growing cherries, you know, it was difficult. Uh, now it's almost next to impossible. And, and I'm sure many of you in your respective uh, 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 crops, uh, you know, you're, you're seeing that same thing that, uh, you know, we, we our, our office is mother nature. That's where we do our work. And, uh, you know, explain it to somebody working in an office. Uh, imagine if somebody comes by and says, hey, uh, your income, we're cutting that in half, you know, have a, have a, a good rest of your day and then you move on. They'll say, well, that's not what I signed up for. And, and we, so we've, uh, you know, that's, that's we, we, and we, we know we have these risks, but now it's just gone to that extra level that's getting really difficult to manage. So what, uh, you know, what I, what I wanted to highlight is the, these business risk management programs we have. From my view, they, yes, they're there to offset the, the problems we have every you know, few seasons or every four seasons, you might have ran into some problems, but I, I, I believe that they were not designed for having consecutive hardships stacked on one another. Um, so that, that's something that I want to bring to the discussion. Uh, I'll be advocating that uh, as, a, as a member on the N NPAC committee, that, that they need to be really reviewed on, on the current uh, situation, what's going on in agriculture. And, and that's the, because the uh, you know, example in the crop insurance, yes, we, we did get some money in crop insurance, we insured to the maximum, but what's happening is that now I'm not gonna be covered for a heck of a lot because I'm showing them I don't produce all that much. So it, it, does, it does continue to head uh, downward. Um, Maybe I'll, 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 uh, I'll jump to, uh, you know, I can, I can talk forever on challenges. I'm sure you guys could, <laughs> could as well. But, but you know, to, to brighten things a bit, the, the uh, uh, investments in, in, in research. So we've benefited greatly from the uh, Summerland Research and Development Center. Uh, I can say without a doubt, without the varieties that they produce, there wouldn't be a cherry industry in the Okanagan. Uh, the late season cherries, they've allowed us to, to get away from Washington State's crop. And, and then get to those, uh, those export markets uh, where, where they are paying top dollars for, for our fruits. So the um, you know, investments in new rootstocks that are more tolerant to, to heat and to cold, uh, varieties that are, are hardier, that's where, you know, the, where we can look to, to move forward uh, because you know, we, uh, I, I don't see a bunch of people here that are ready to give up, that's not in our nature. Uh, we're just, we're, 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 we've got a, a really, uh, uh, a big challenge ahead of us, 
but it is, uh, you know, the title, re resiliency in agriculture, we hear that a lot. Uh, adapt, that's, that's what we really need to do, and, and that's what I, I, I hope to see with, with government programs is, you know, how, what does the cherry orchard or whatever farm look like with taking all these factors in play? And, and that's where um, ideas, uh, discussion, I think that's where, it, where we, we uh, it need to be spending the time because hoping that the climate's going to get back to what it was, we, we all know that that's not, not likely. So uh, getting ahead of adapt, uh, adapting our, our farms to what's coming. And, and, and the key thing is uh, viability of, of being able to, uh, to pay the bills. You know, we, it, shouldn't, it shouldn't be that it's an industry that struggles year in and year out. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that as, a, as, a, as the start there, and I, and I think uh, I'll pass it back to, to Karen for, uh, for what's next. Thanks, uh, thanks, Sue Paul. I'm gonna put on my panelist hat and, and talk a little bit about um, the fertilizer sector and some of our um, challenges and, and opportunities. Uh, I think many of you can tell me about challenges and opportunities with regards to fertilizer. It's been uh, a really tough couple of years, uh, certainly since I joined the association. I think one of the things one of my colleagues told me uh, early on was that nobody talks about fertilizer until there isn't enough. Um, well, the last couple of years, we have been dealing with some significant supply challenges. And so fertilizer being a, a product that's traded globally, we're subject to supply demand issues. Um, but most of, of our challenges really have been related to, to supply. So we've had uh, tremendous weather events, so, so similar um, concerns where a lot of our nitrogen uh, manufacturing that happens in the U.S. is down in, uh, in uh, sort of Texas, Louisiana area. We've had, seen hurricanes. We saw an ice storm in Texas. Uh, who'd have thought that would happen? Um, and those things, of course, shut down facilities. And, and those facilities that operate 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can't make up that shortage in supply when they shut down. That, that production is, is lost. Um, so we've seen weather, weather issues. We can't, uh, we can't control those. We've seen other geopolitical uh, issues. So the protect protectionism of China, where they are protecting domestic supply, China being a big uh, producer and supplier of fertilizers for the world, uh, stopping um, uh, exports of, of their products uh, definitely impacts supply on a, on a global scale, putting more pressure on those countries that do produce fertilizers. Um, we've seen uh, sanctions on Belarus. Again, uh, shortly after their election, uh, a number of countries placing sanctions on Belarus, another big supplier of of fertilizer products and, and where fertilizer products get, get moved through. Um, the price of natural gas, I think everybody uh, can, can see it now, but even before, before the, the war in Ukraine, we saw the price of natural gas in Europe going so high that again, fertilizer facilities had to shut down production um, because of that and, and again, uh, shorting supply. Then, of course, um, the illegal invasion of Ukraine by Russia. And um, again, just another factor uh, affecting the global market of supply, uh, Russia being, again, a, a huge uh, supplier of, of fertilizers. And we've seen other issues that have come up, by um, transportation around strikes and blockades within Canada. And so lots of, of short to medium term issues that have affected the supply of, of fertilizer, which then of, of course affects the price of fertilizer and affects the, uh, the farmers. Um, on the demand side of that equation, of course crop pricing being very high as well just spurs more and more demand. And for the first time I think ever as, a, as an association, uh, last year, we were getting other um, embassies and consulates. Uh, I was mentioning the agriculture minister from Brazil coming to meet with us, asking me to go to the embassy and meet with the ambassador because they were desperate 
to um, get their hands on Canadian fertilizer supplies because they were concerned that they wouldn't have the supply for their own countries. And so you can see that the global demand uh, was huge. It, it reminds me, and, and you know, it's a, it's a bit of a leap, but it reminds me at the beginning of COVID of the toilet paper craze that we had and everybody wanted to get their hands on toilet paper because we weren't gonna have enough. Well, that's what happened uh, with the Russian invasion of Ukraine is countries were terrified that there wasn't going to be enough um, fertilizer and, and uh, the demand spiked and, and, and it, it affected supply uh, tremendously. Um, other challenges, and, and we heard a lot about this over the last couple of days, um, is the, the U.S. Inflation Reduction Act. And, and the challenge of that is taking away investments from Canada and diverting them down to the U.S. because of, um, and I think it was uh, John Stackhouse who talked about carrots and sticks and how the U.S. approach is very much, you know, the bushels of carrots being provided to, to the industry to invest in growing their uh, facilities and their businesses in the U.S. versus the, you know, bundle of sticks approach that some would say it has been sort of the traditional approach in Canada, which um, may be affecting the ability of, uh, or the interest of companies to invest in, in this country. And, and I think we've seen how important it is to have um, the Canadian fertilizer industry to be strong in this country. We didn't have to run around to other countries begging for fertilizer supply. We make fertilizer in this country, we're the number one for uh, producers of potash uh, in the world, uh, we're number nine in nitrogen production. Um, but we could we could do more. Uh, but the 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 U.S. has certainly put in place policies that have uh, woken a lot of people up, and I, I think there are opportunities there. Um, but we have to be concerned about how that is driving those investments away from Canada into the U.S. Um, in the long term, ultimately, the challenge um, for us and for, for all of you in the room is we have to produce more food with less land while reducing emissions and other environmental impacts. And that's a tremendous challenge. I think, uh, I think we're up for the, for the task, but that really is the long-term challenge um, for Canada that, that I think uh, requires some really innovative thinking and some, some new policies in order for us to achieve that. Um, so that all sounds really kind of dire and, and negative, but, but on the upside, uh, at least for our sector, people are talking about fertilizer. Um, when I joined Fertilizer Canada a couple of years ago, I was told by, by the hiring committee that nobody really talks about fertilizer very much. I'm sure everyone in this room talks about fertilizer, but the mainstream media doesn't run stories about fertilizer on the news. Um, the average person who's never set foot on a farm doesn't talk about fertilizer supply, doesn't even know what fertilizer is. And, and I think we've seen over the course of uh, the last year, the interest in the fertilizer sector, not only from sort of the general public, but now to our, our elected officials, really increasing about the importance of fertilizer um, for, for the agricultural sector, the good news story, the success story that the fertilizer industry is for this country. Um, I was counting the number of times I heard fertilizer being mentioned by the various leaders we saw yesterday, and I was, I was very pleased that, that almost every single one of them talked about fertilizer, and so that's great. It's great that we've got people talking about fertilizer. It's great that there's a recognition of the importance of fertilizer. I would argue fertilizer is the most important product in the world. Maybe I'm a bit biased. It's certainly one of the most important uh, inputs, crop inputs um, that you can have. And if we're going to meet that challenge of growing more food on less land, we need to have a, a strong and thriving fertilizer sector. So I think there's lots of opportunities um, for the sector. As I mentioned, we are in Canada the number one producer of potash in the world. Uh, we are followed by Russia and Belarus. And so 
if you ask me the question of where you want to get your fertilizer, if you're looking at it from a global perspective, who is the dependable source of potash? It's Canada by far. Um, so I think there's lots of opportunity there. We are the number nine producer of nitrogen fertilizers in the world. The number one producer is China. Again, who is that dependable supply of fertilizer? I think that's, I think that's Canada. I was on a, a panel not that long ago uh, by the Chamber of Commerce, and I, I sort of posed the hypothetical question. Canada currently supplies 12% of the world's fertilizer. Why isn't it 20%? How do we get from 12 to 20? I don't know the answer to that. I, I should. We're working on it. Um, but I think that's the real opportunity, is for Canada to invest in this sector so that we really are that dependable source of fertilizer, not only domestically, but, but globally. And I think that's the, the real opportunity. We just need to build the right environment for that investment to come into Canada. Um, and I think I'll stop there and maybe pass things over to... Uh, to Tom to talk uh, about challenges and opportunities. Yeah, for sure. Thanks, uh, Karen. Seems like the mic's working. Um, yeah, and maybe I'll start in a similar place to, to Sue, Paul, and Karen, just by, as we approach, we're, I think, about a week or so away from um, the third anniversary of when things started to lock down across the country with uh, COVID. And when I think back in the, you know, in the, the, the over that period of time, there really have been a remarkable number of uh, challenges and headwinds that have faced the agriculture and agri-food uh, industries over that period of time. I had to jot down notes to name them all because there's so many that I thought I might, I might forget otherwise. But starting with COVID where, I mean, it turned the world on its head no matter who you were uh, or what you did. But for the Canadian ag sector, the huge issues around supply chains and borders, um, the, uh, the concern about um, uh, securing adequate labor, including uh, temporary foreign workers and, and migrant laborers uh, for, for, the, for the crop here. The huge swings in demand for food we saw as a result of the virtual total closure of the, the so-called HRI sector, hotels, restaurants, uh, institutions. And, you know, into 2021, Sue Paul talked about uh, about the, the the heat dome that we saw in in Western North America. Of course, that was followed by a drought that covered that impact a drought the likes of which we have not seen at least since the 1960s that affected pretty much the entirety of Western Canada and into uh, into Northwestern Ontario. Um, and then and then a few months later we saw the uh, the atmospheric river event on the lower mainland of British Columbia which of course directly impacted agriculture in, in the Abbotsford region but also just Port of Vancouver being a major uh, a major gateway for uh, agricultural uh, products including uh, including potash um, you know and the the, the damage to the uh, the rail and road infrastructure into that region also had ramifications for for you know basically right uh, right across the country. Into 2022, we've already talked about Russia's invasion of Ukraine, what that did to input prices like uh, um, fertilizer and fuel. Of course, it also contributed to, to the, the inflationary trend that we saw uh, in Canada and, and, and right around the world that's, uh, that's led to, uh, to, uh, to higher interest rates. We had, um, we had the potato ward issue, we had, we've had avian in influenza in 2022, I think in just about every province, uh, in fact, every single province in the country, uh, I believe. And um, we saw very high uh, levels of mortality, uh, over winter mortality in bee populations heading into uh, to last springtime. But despite all of that, 2020, um, the, the year of, of COVID, was a year of record farm incomes in Canada. 2021, uh, we saw that number increase by about 30%. And we're still waiting for the, the, uh, the data um, for 2022. Um, but uh, our best guess is, is that it's going to be maybe just a little bit ahead of 2021 levels. And why is that? You could have these massive headwinds and shocks to, to the agriculture and the agri-food system and yet see, see by some measures, um, you know, record levels of income. And I should add as well, 
big picture, the, uh, the trade data show a similar story. Uh, Prime Minister mentioned yesterday, 2022 exports of agri-food products, including seafood from Canada, $92.6 million or thereabouts, I think. Um, his, as he uh, mentioned, his government in uh, budget 2017 has set a target of $75 billion in agri-food exports by 2025. We've kind of blown that out of the water. And it was interesting. I remember uh, in the days after the budget set that $75 billion target, talking to some of my economics team at the time, and they were kind of saying, at the, I believe at the time, uh, agri-food exports were in the neighborhood of about $57 billion. And they were saying, I don't know about this $75 billion target. You know, we've had a really good run the past 10 years. Um, I think it's going to be a pretty heavy lift to get to, get to $75 billion by, uh, by 2025. And, and I share this anecdote not to denigrate the predictive ability of the economics team at the department, but rather to make the point that this sector, not only over the past couple of years, but going back 10 or 15, has consistently outperformed at an aggregate level um, what expert opinion thought was, uh, was possible. And why is that? And in part, I think in large part, it's a tribute to the, uh, to the, the resilience and adaptability of the, peop of the sector itself and the, 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 the people that make it up. But I think it also, what gives you a chance to climb back from really significant setbacks is just really positive uh, global fundamentals. Um, you know, the, uh, the global population uh, surpassed, I think it was in November, surpassed 8 billion people. Um, to put that in context, we were about 5.2, I believe, 1990, you go back to 1950, it was 2.6. So you've seen this very, very rapid growth in population. Very, ra I mean, although it's been set back uh, in the years since COVID, we'd seen over time very rapid growth in, uh, in, in incomes, uh, especially in lower income countries, which tends to, you know, lead to higher demand for more and better quality food. Um, I was, accompanied uh, Minister Bibo on a trip to, uh, the, we went to the Philippines and Indonesia a couple of months ago, and Philippines is a country of about 110 million people. Indonesia is a country of 275 million people. They're both, certainly by Canadian standards, they're fairly poor places. Per capita GDP is under $5,000 a year. But when, you, when you're there, you sense this huge dynamism and er, energy. They both are growing very rapidly. They both already are significant agricultural uh, markets for us. Exports to the Philippines, I think, run about $600 million, mostly grain, pork. Um, Indonesia is a, is a, was over a billion dollars for us last year. Um, and these countries with the land bases that they have, as their demand for food grows, they're not going to be able to fill that themselves. Um, there's, there's huge long-term opportunity. They're not particularly easy places uh, to do business. Um, and they are not among the 51 countries in the world with whom we have uh, bilateral trade agreements, but we are in the midst of negotiating bilaterally uh, with Indonesia, and uh, um, the Philippines is part of the ASEAN group of Southeast Asian countries uh, with whom we are also uh, in negotiations towards, uh, towards a free trade agreement. While we were in uh, Indonesia, one of the things we talked to them about uh, was uh, better market access for Canadian, uh, Canadian pork products. And you might reasonably ask, well, why would you be doing that in a majority Muslim country? And the answer is that yes, Indonesia is 85% Muslim, but 15% of 275 million people is still a really, uh, a really significant market. Um, they also, as I was mentioning to Karen, uh, they were very keen to talk to us about fertilizer. They're big buyers of, uh, of, of, Canadian, uh, of Canadian potash. So, and you know, we're really excited about the opportunities in the Indo-Pacific region uh, and what they, uh, what they mean for Canada. That's why um, a couple of months ago, the government announced $31 million to, to establish a, a Canadian agri-food office in the, uh, in the region. Um, and I mean, although we, as it is, we have trade commissioners focused on agriculture and some of the embassies and consulates in the region. We have veterinarians and other technical experts, but we don't really, compared to what the Australians and the Americans, uh, the Europeans have in the region, we don't have uh, anything equivalent. And the idea for this office came out of discussions that we'd had with the canola sector, the meat sector, among others, over the past couple of years, looking at models like Canada Wood and how we could bolster our capacity in the region. And so. 
the idea of the office is to you know, have technical resources. So when somebody rejects a shipment of meat or grain or whatever it is, we don't have to send somebody from Ottawa over to deal with it. We will have somebody in the region, we'll build relationships, we'll be able to be more proactive and less reactive to, to hopefully avoid uh, market, as, market access issues before they get out of hand. And, and it isn't, our focus will principally be trade and market access, but we also hope to build relationships uh, for foreign direct investments and, uh, and other uh, uh, purposes through, uh, through having a, a bigger presence there. I, I'm probably talked too long already, Karen, but uh, I, um, I will uh, we'll look to, uh, to, uh, to kind of um, wrap this up. Um, that, and I, I, don't, I say that like, I'm sure if we went around the room with the producers here that, you know, whether it was Hurricane Fiona or a potato wart uh, or weather events that, uh, that every producer in the room would have, uh, would have a story similar to, to Suk Paul's about some of the challenges that they faced uh, over the past couple of years. And I realized too that when you look at aggregate income numbers or export numbers, they mask the fact that underneath that there are over 100,000 individual businesses that look very, very different and things have certainly been a lot better in some sectors and some regions uh, than others. It doesn't, uh, I'm not trying to minimize in any way the very real challenges that probably every single one of you has faced. And even for those of you at the end of the year when you added up the numbers and they actually didn't look that bad, there probably was, an, I'm sure there was a lot of anxiety and a lot of, uh, a lot of adversity uh, along the way. And I don't mean in any way to, to minimize that, uh, but I, I, I think there's value in remembering that there, the glass is half full, um, that the climate challenges that, that, that we all face are faced by uh, um, our competitors around the world. And in a lot of ways for places that were hotter and drier to begin with in Canada, they're often that much tougher to deal with uh, in the agricultural sector. That the, the fundamentals are strong, that there's a lot of really positive things that have happened over a couple of years. And you know whether it's getting to 20% potash, whether it's some of the technology and innovation we talked about, that that there's, there's lots and lots and lots of, uh, of longer term uh, uh, opportunity in the global marketplace for us and, and it's something to be excited about. Great. Well, thanks, Tom. Um, so we are going to move to uh, a bit of a QA. and a I've got a couple of questions to start off uh, to, get things, to get things going, but I'd welcome anyone to stand up and come to the mic and, and ask uh, whatever questions you would like. Um, but I will start off and, and ask uh, our panelists about, um, you know, whether you can speak to one particular specific challenge or opportunity that you feel Canadian agriculture has to face in the next five to ten years, and then what actions need to be prioritized in order to overcome that challenge or, or seize the opportunity. Um, and I'm going to take the prerogative of answering that question first <laughs> before I pass it on to my, to my fellow panelists, because that, uh, that is my right as moderator. Um, but certainly for our sector in, in fertilizer, I think our, our biggest challenge right now is, is really just navigating through some of the climate change initiatives and, and, and the agenda and making sure that we do that in the right way and find practical and pragmatic solutions to meet, I think, what is a shared objective of everyone uh, in this room and the government um, really to, to reduce um, emissions and manage climate change. I think you hear about challenges on farm and, and many of those are, are weather uh, related, I, I think that's um, quite evident, but, but certainly finding a way to ensure that we don't cast sort of the same initiatives widely without thinking about the regionality, the specifics of agriculture, the differences in, in soil across the country, the difference in farming, in, in uh, crops, and, and and I think that's a, a real challenge for government um, to try and come up with an approach that isn't a one size fits all because one size doesn't fit all. Um, and it's tough from a public policy perspective as to how then do we address these, these big policy issues. And, and so I think that certainly for fertilizer, that's our biggest 
challenge that I can see, or certainly a significant um, challenge. And, and you know, what we really need to do, and I think what the government has, has um, already begun to do, is really to work with um, producers and grower groups and others to try and find those more specific um, solutions. I think I heard, it might have been even you, Mary, once at a conference recently say, you know, not a, about farmers without farmers or not about farming without farmers and really needing to bring the group to the table to talk about what works, what's not going to work, how do we ensure that we continue to be a productive um, sector while still looking at our environmental impact. And I don't think we've got that solution today. I don't think we've got the right approach or the right targets or the right path forward, but I think we do have a willingness on the government side to, um, to figure it out, and, and we really have no choice but to do so. And so that's where I see you know, real opportunities in the next five to 10 years, um, but, but some significant manpower required or woman power to required to, to sort it out. Um, but maybe I can pass it along, uh, Sukhpal, to you to talk about sort of where you see um, the, the biggest challenge or opportunity in your, in your sector. I see somebody standing right here who I want to give you a chance first. Uh, please Let's go Let's go. <coughs> Jim Bateman from Haypass. And our Crops and Transportation Committee made a resolution to uh, Saskatchewan, Saskatchewan Crop Insurance exactly along the same lines as your problem with you continue to have lesser yields, your insurance drops to it's, it's not a supportive level for a farm. And our suggestion is that there be a base level uh, set so that, you know, that there may be at least a break even point when your yields drop. Um, now, I don't know if this uh, should be talked about at CFA, but it seems to me it should be that crop insurance across the country should be uh, looking at establishes a base level where crops continue to fall. And you know what Saskatchewan's like for in the southwest where I come from, that my coverage is continuing to fall, except if you look at my 10-year average, I have an, just an excellent, but after two or three years of losses, I'm not going to have that coverage anymore. Yeah, if if, if I could, uh, yeah, add to to what you're saying. You know, we we're thinking about the same things at, at night. You know, what's what's going on with with our coverage and and what I uh, talking to some of the uh, the. Um, the government staff that work with these programs, they, they tell tell me, well, you know, there's the, uh, we got to follow insurance principles and all that, it's, there's a, the standard to follow. So what I've, what I've kind of come up with as a potential solution that should be looked at is, we've got, we've got crop insurance or production insurance, and then you've got agri-recovery when things get really, really bad and, and they come in on a disaster. I'm looking for something in between those that you've, you, you continue to, to have uh, uh, you know, uh, really bad seasons and it, it's stacking up on top like, like you've seen, your average is going down. So, so that's what I'm looking for as, as a new approach because like I mentioned earlier, uh, these programs weren't designed for continual uh, you know, uh, disastrous seasons and, and, and I, yes, I'm in a, in a really sensitive crop, but. Uh, that's the only crop that I can see as a, a potential to earn money with the returns. Uh, I, I joke, if, if apples uh, were a strong return, I'd be an apple farmer, not a cherry grower. You know, that's, that's the real, uh, so that's, but that's the reality is that we need to, we need to try to generate the highest income because it's a, it's a, a very expensive area. So, so I, yeah, I, I, I hear what you're saying and ideas need to be discussed in, in how, do we, how do we keep that level quite strong. In our case, it's not just one crop, it's, you know, cereals, oil seeds, pulses, uh, uh, and feed grain. And, but it comes back to the same thing. If you have a poor crop in your cereal grain, you're gonna have a poor crop pretty near for sure in oil seeds. So I think that for our area, it's a bundle of crops, but for your area, it's just a little different. But in, it's the same principle that our yields are dropping so rapidly and so fast that the insurance isn't, is, is too expensive, but then it comes back to the principles of it has to break even somewhere uh, in the industry. And you know, as well as I do, the, the assistance that SAS crop insurance and uh, the federal government, the premiums and uh, the insurance coverages is really good. But it, 
it's limited when you have poor crops. Thank you. Yeah, okay. thank, thanks for your question. Uh, I'll, I'll, maybe, I'll maybe jump back to, to uh, Karen's question there. Uh, you know, I look at the extreme climate, and, and I'll, I'll, I'm basically speaking to, to what I know is in the, in the cherry industry, and that part of it, and then labor is the other part that is, uh, is on my mind, because uh, those of you that are in horticulture, the amount, uh, the amount of uh, uh, labor that we need, especially hand-picked crops, so all of our cherries, the sweet cherries, I wish we had a machine that got them off the tree, but they are all hand-picked, every single one of them. So, so we go from, our operations have, you know, it could be, you know, five to ten workers uh, throughout most of the season, and then we jump up to 100, 150 when we need to to get the the cherries off. And some of our larger producers, you know, they're getting they're up in the 800 uh, uh, foreign worker range. So what I, what I wanted to maybe uh, add add to the discussion, and I heard I heard uh, heard it uh, from some of the um, uh, uh, MPs uh, leaders uh, yesterday. Yes, uh, yesterday uh, the foreign worker program, how it, how, how it's set up. Now, from my personal experience, 15 plus years I've been applying to this program, and I'm sure some of you are in that same boat. So, but it's called the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. I'm doing that 15 years in a, in a row. It's not all that temporary. So, um, and, and it's just, you know, it's kind of, it's, uh, yeah, we can we laugh at it, but you, you send in that application, a new officer kind of emails you and asks you a few questions about farming, which they, I'm sure they don't know the answers themselves, and you, you got to give, the, give them the response of, yes, I need workers because of this, this, and this. So, so I, uh, I, I, what I would like to see as, as an improvement and, and, and how we move forward on that is, is really recognizing that, yeah, it, it, labor, we're going to be needing it, and changing that model more towards a relationship model that here is my contact at the government that understands my labor needs in cherries and, and a specialist in other areas. And we keep an open channel of how's the season looking? Are you gonna need more workers? Yeah, it looks like a heavy crop. Okay, can we cr increase that to 20 more? Yeah, uh, uh, I've just increased your file for 20 more workers. So I, I think um, as, an, as an opportunity or how we can improve on that, that side of it is, is really, um, you know, come to the realization uh, for some sectors this is not temporary. It, it, uh, I, I tell people my staff live in a different country. That's that's the reality, and and have to get them over. But going through the uh, the red, red tape, and and uh, and here's a, here's another uh, joke when people ask me, oh, what do you farm? I say paperwork. You know, and look at them with a straight face, you know? and uh, and they're like paperwork. But you know, uh, in this room everybody instantly gets it when, when they say I farm paperwork because that is that priority and then the, the farming side of it comes afterwards. So, so yeah, just op opening our eyes to, to hey, this, this labor issue, especially in horticulture, uh, is, is a very important uh, thing that needs to be looked at and let's, let's look at it more realistically in, in, in a sound plan that, that aligns with what's really going on instead of a, a thinking, a, thinking that all of a sudden we're gonna have a whole bunch of Canadians that are willing to, to get out in, in the field. So, um, so yeah, there's, there's my rant on labor. So, <laughs> um, Thanks, Andy. So, so Tom, you, um, you would get a different view from, from where you sit um, in, in government, and I'm sure you, you hear from many of us our challenges and opportunities. Can you, can you think about something that really um, sort of comes to mind as, as the biggest challenge or opportunity or both over the next five to 10 years and, and where you see sort of the need for, for new policies, changes, interventions? Yeah, actually, Karen, when I think about that, your original question, um, it, I was very similar place to you. I really think it's the environment and sustainability. And, and going back to the earlier panel, I mean, I don't think it's all challenge. I think there's some real opportunities there. Uh, and I think the challenges are as much with government to get things right as they are with producers. And, and recognizing, too, the government, you know, yes, the government has targets on climate change and, and biodiversity, but I think irrespective of government policy, when I look at, you know, whether it's Nestle or McKinsey or Maple Leaf or some of the big b buyers of, 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 uh, of uh, agricultural products, um, the, the sort of sustainability targets that they're setting, there's pressure from, from all, and, and an opportunity, I think, from all, all different uh, segments of the value chain um, for, a, for a focus there. 
Um, and I think the job, a big part of the job for government is to figure out, we don't have as a country a lot of experience with things like payment for ecosystem services and so on. Figuring out how to deploy the carrots in a, in a strategic and sensible way that's sensitive to the realities in uh, uh, across different realities across the country is really complicated and it's important that we get it right. We did over the course of this week have a, just yesterday had a, a consultation here um, yesterday morning on our sustainable agriculture strategy. I know Mary Robinson has been making sure that we're listening to farmers as we move forward because it isn't just climate change and emissions. It's climate, climate, climate adaptation. It's biodiversity. Um, and, and sometimes the things you do uh, to advance one of those goals can be complementary to, to advancing others, right? Sometimes, but not always, and figuring out what makes economic and environmental and ecological sense and, and trying to pick the low-hanging fruit first is, 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 and, and, and like, you know, is what we're trying to do, but it's, uh, it's not an easy thing. Part of that, and it came up from, the, from Sukhpal and, and the questioner is, I mean, one of the things government needs to rethink in, is in the context of climate change is what that means for our programming and our business risk management programs. Um, that insurance program, you know, whether they be government sponsored or private, tend to be built on the assumption that tomorrow's gonna be a lot like yesterday, right? And as the climate changes, um, thinking about how we structure agri-insurance, um, you know, and, and learning, you know, we've been dealing with uh, the aftermath of the, the atmospheric river and, and Hurricane Fiona. And sometimes it doesn't make sense just to build back what was there before. Sometimes you want to, in building back from an, uh, a, a, a crisis, uh, build back infrastructure that's, that's more resilient. And how do you change your programs to do that? I would note that Minister Bebo has a commitment about, uh, in her mandate letter, about uh, looking at the BRM programs in the context. I can't, I don't have the, the letter in front of me, don't remember the exact wording, but looking at BRM programming and agri-insurance in the context of, uh, of, uh, of a changing, uh, changing climate. I love the imagery it brings to mind when you said um, deploying the, the carrots. Yeah. Uh, I wonder what that's going to look like. Um, but you mentioned, oh, I think we've got a, a, a question, so we'll, we'll jump to that, sir. Hi. Uh, thanks. Uh, Devin Walker with APAS, uh, Agricultural Producers Association of Saskatchewan. Uh, thanks, you all, for being here. I guess I have two questions. I'm trying to be efficient with my steps. Uh, one question is, uh, I know we talk about... Everybody in this room understands sustainability and we understand that the Canadian product is a very quality product and our customers currently seek it. And even our Prime Minister yesterday was telling us how the, you know, the maple leaf on our products is a, is a high standard. So we're, I feel we're already rather high. We're, we're a country of rules. We, we have laws in place on labour and drainage and all sorts of things. And we're wanting to do better upon that. So. At times, it feels like we're a bit of an echo chamber nationally where we have kind of full belly policies and it's, it's a fine line between we got to get it right, otherwise we have full belly policies limiting or restricting the amount of product we can send to empty belly countries or empty belly nations, which is, I mean, that's a very simplistic way to look at it. But, but somewhere at the end of the line, as a broad acre farmer in Saskatchewan, it's export. Export, export, export. Uh, the, the panel before us talked about Saskatchewan has it right with trade deals. So like 95% of our product leaves Canada and we have 5% of our product stays here. So we have 5% of our consumer base is pounding the table asking for this and that will impact the other 95% of what we're able to do and achieve. So that has to be right. Otherwise, we have a minority pushing a majority into some not great places. So I guess, what's your thoughts around that? And then deployment, as a producer myself, extra paperwork is terrible. Uh, so I, I wanted to, I guess, stress or, or ask about using provincial crop insurance offices in somehow partnership to verify you know, they're, they're a government-tied organization that has boots on the ground to verify these sustainability metrics and changes, and they have the data on regionality and soils and records and production. And, you know, it's this geospatial database there that I think could be a tool uh, that is still already a vehicle we're using. You know, 85% of Saskatchewan producers, I believe, is, are in the crop insurance program. And, and we're comfortable with that vehicle 
reporting to it. We're comfortable with the times and the production and so on. Even if we're not comfortable with the level of coverage, uh, we're still utilizing that outlet. So do you see that as a, as a forward path for deployment if it's done right? So, yeah, sorry for rambling on, but my two-part question, the kind of the Canadian echo chamber and how much of that actually leaves Canada and then uh, the crop insurance deployment part. Uh, if, maybe I'll talk over the uh, export side if you want to talk about the, uh, the crop insurance a bit there. Uh, yeah, thanks, thanks for the question. Um, so, so cherries, we're, we're very familiar with export because uh, that's predominantly uh, what, what, we, uh, what we gear towards because those, those cro that, that crop uh, is, is sought after in, 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 in some countries that have very high disposable income. And, and going back to the, uh, Canada's reputation, Yes, C CFIA, uh, very high standards, and it's very well respected internationally that safe food is coming to uh, coming from for, out, coming out of Canada to other countries. So that's that is a a, a, a huge bonus and, and a very good um, call it a, a, a sales pitch or, or or you know to promote to promote to promote our products. Where where the improvement? So uh, we have such capacity, yeah, to grow so much and and get it out into different markets, but. I know there's the there's the um, the flagship trade shows where there are more more Canadian producers, but I've been uh, uh, been to some of the uh, you know the Asia Fruit Logistica the the Berlin trade show, and I look at countries' booths and the the promotion of pushing their products and and, and that economic activity. Countries like I've never even heard of this country. Holy smokes! Look at the size of their booth. It goes goes on forever. And and then our, our little you know Canadian square is this one little area. So. Uh, so with the and, and apologize if I'm not getting to what you're wanting to ask, but uh, it, it's I, I, what I what I want to say is there there is uh, definitely a lot more potential for us to to promote our products and and have that government investment. The, the tra it was, it was mentioned before the the trade commissioners that are around the world, mm -hmm. a huge asset for us, and, and I encourage anybody who, uh, from their associations, if you're looking to get into new markets, they, uh, I, I just, before I came out here, the, the rep from Mexico uh, was at my farm and came to, came to visit, and we chatted about cherries and, and what's the potential, and he's gonna go do that market research and, and, and get back to me. Uh, that's, that, that is their, their job, so, so uh, if, yeah, to, to, to sum up that, that part of it is that we can, we can do a, a, a lot more on the exports. We've got these this great conditions with CFIA having a great reputation, but the, the investment of, of energy uh, uh, in, in the uh, market, uh, uh, market access, uh, the uh, secretariat, the, the pest risk assessments, all those, as, as Tom would know, takes, takes time, they're in the years, right? But if we can have more, more, more people in those offices working on those files, that advances everything. So, so there's, there's, I think, a, a, a strong potential for us to, to get into some, uh, some markets if we've, if we've got the, the staff and resources to, to work on our behalf. I'll let you, maybe everyone touch on that as well. Or. Maybe I'll start the, the point on paper burden has, uh, has come up a couple of times. Maybe a couple observations there. Um, one, uh, Suval, you talked about your experience with the Temporary Foreign Worker Program. I don't think it came up when he was here yesterday, but when uh, the Prime Minister visited the Union de Producteurs Agricoles in uh, Longueuil a couple of weeks ago, he talked about um, the Trusted Employer Program and the model there is, I mean, it's sort of similar to a Nexus card, right? Uh, somebody who's got an established a track, track record as, a, as a, an employer that follows rules would have a, a less burdensome process to apply for temporary foreign workers. It's something Mr. Bebo is very committed to, and like I said, the Prime Minister did, did talk about it uh, uh, recently with, uh, with, a, with a group of, of producers. I mean, it's just one example. It may not always be <laughs> obvious to people outside of government, but uh, we, um, there are some opportunities uh, using, you know, essentially big data for us to simplify and streamline some of our application processes, make them a little bit smarter. Within, it's probably not apparent to many of you, but we did 
create a position of a chief um, a data officer in the department, um, I think about two years ago now. We're building databases that will, while respecting privacy and so on, allow us to track in a much more sophisticated way our interactions with different farms and agri-food businesses so that you don't, every time you call us, it's not like you're starting from zero with some, some new person. You see it as well in some of our data gathering. I, I, I think Statistics Canada, in terms of the number of surveys they have to do of farmers, has, has has gone down is they use more earth observation data or what they call administrative data, data from tax filings and other things that, that people have to share um, to, to reduce the amount of uh, uh, times they have to survey producers uh, in order to, um, uh, to, to, to you know, publish the, the data that they do. So, like I said, a lot of it's kind of back office stuff that wouldn't be, you don't read about in the newspaper very often, it's not, uh, wouldn't be very visible even to those of you that deal with the department frequently. But we are little by little um, looking at how, like I said, essentially big data can help us to make uh, uh, some of our programs and services a little bit, uh, little bit less burdensome, uh, a little bit more accessible. Thanks. Um, so Tom, I wanted to follow up on, on sort of your last comments uh, before the question um, related to the sustainable agriculture strategy. So you've, you mentioned that. I know there was some discussion here yesterday about that. Um, I'm just wondering um, if you can speak to sort of the hopes and expectations for this strategy and, and for um, sustainability and environmental performance, um, 2030, 2050, how the strategy fits in, uh, maybe provide a bit of, of commentary on that. Sure, uh, Karen, and the way I think of it um, is that, uh, you know, just coming back, we touched on this earlier, that we talk about the environment. We're not trying to do one thing or focus on one environmental attribute. We've got ambitions to, you know, to, to lower input intensity, to lower emissions, to make the sector more resilient and adaptable to, uh, a, you know, a changing climate. We've got targets on biodiversity. We care about water quality. Um, and so I, this, the idea of the strategy, the way I think of it anyway, is that if you go focusing on those things kind of in isolation, it can sometimes pull you in different directions and at cross purposes. And so the idea is to look at environmental performance for the agri agriculture sector as a whole in all of its dimensions so that we can kind of capture those synergies, we can avoid left hand, right hand issues as we try to you know, move forward on, on emissions targets, on adaptation, on biodiversity targets, um, and, uh, and so that we do it in a coordinated way that, that you know, looks at the entirety of agriculture, I think is in, in essence what we're trying to do. So I think, do we have a question or, here we go. Mark Reeser, OFA. And you're, you were tasked with talking about challenges and opportunities. And you've touched on something today that uh, I think about a lot. We as farmers think one of our challenges is too much paperwork. And I'm, I'm part of supply management, so I deal with binders of paperwork. Um, and I hear it all the time, and I wonder, are we unique in agriculture, or is every industry dealing with the same issue of having to document and write everything down and redo it and so on? So that's the, ch that's the, the challenge, and I wonder if there is an opportunity there to in fact do less, or are we always going to have to do more in order to satisfy the requirements that society puts on us? That's a great, I think that's a great question. Um, so I was in a whole other sector before I joined Fertilizer Canada. I spent my entire career in the health sector. Talk about paperwork. Um, I don't think it's just the, the agriculture sector that has to deal with mountains and mountains of paperwork. And whenever you're in any sort of regulated sector, there's paperwork that, that um, is, is part of that. We certainly benefited um, back when I was in, in the health sector from some of the government initiatives around red tape reduction and trying to, to streamline. And, and so I think, I hope it's, it's not a growing problem, but one that is diminishing. And to your points, Tom, that, you know, that we're using data in different ways. But, but I don't know, um, Tom, if you want to sort of speak to 
to the future of paperwork? Uh, are we going paperless? Um, some of our processes are, are going more and more online. Certainly we saw, uh, we sort of had to do that during COVID with some of our services and, and, and uh, recognizing that, you know, um, in, although the, we are, are making progress in that as well, connectivity isn't uh, what it needs to be yet uh, across the country. And, and for some people who live in more rural and remote areas that uh, that, that, that can be a challenge. Um, like I said, I think there is some opportunity to, we are in oblivious to paper burden um, where we, you know, I think though there's a, there's a um, I, and, and I think you're right, Karen, that in a, you know, a safety sensitive sector, when, you know, there will always be some need for oversight and reporting. Hopefully there are opportunities, you know, using traceability technologies, digitizing certain processes to make them a little bit smarter uh, and easier. Um, I wonder too, and something that I don't, to my knowledge, we haven't done is, I'm thinking in the context of feedback we get on regulation, where we, we are trying to streamline regulation, but oftentimes regulated entities will say, you know, it isn't just you, federal government, that's the problem, it's the cumulative effect of what the labor ministry does for the province and what the municipality requires and so on. And it, it would be interesting when it comes to paper and paper burden to kind of, I don't think governments collectively, uh, at least in the egg world, and to my knowledge, have kind of looked at it from, from the standpoint of the producer, right? Where it isn't just, you know, we're conscious of what we ask people to do. We may be less conscious of what provinces are asking people to do and, and, and on other, other ministries and, and levels of government. And so there, there probably would be benefit in looking at, you know, you know, what's that cumulative burden and what can we, is there, are there ways that we can collectively kind of reduce that? Well, and technology has certainly hel helped with paper burden, although I do remember very recently uh, we put in an access to information request of the federal government and they sent us a disk with the information and we were searching around the office for anyone who had a computer that you could still put a disk in. Um, I think I found something at home to, to read it, so um, there's still probably a ways to go. Sir, I see you at the, uh, at the microphone. Well, if I may, because I know the day is wearing on here, and uh, your, your, your discussions, all topics are all meaningful. I, I wanted to just touch a little bit on. We talk about the value, uh, the value of our exports. Use that for number, and the, the, you know, it reflects around dollars, of course, money, and supply and demand is another factor, which commodity prices can be double the price or triple or whatever, or a third, whichever way you want to go there because of that. And I'm trying to think of the right examples. I mean, you have horsepower and you have torque, and horsepower is how fast you hit the wall, and torque is how much damage you do when you get there. And so in, in nutrition, we value our commodities on the price of them, and what's the value of them once I knew what is, What's the, the nutrition we're exporting per ton or per year? And I, I see our dollars going up. I don't think we're sometimes we're exporting much more nutrition when it comes to feed the world. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. And I'm not sure what's important. Uh, paperwork. Um, I, I'm, I should say my name. My name's Alvin Keenan. I'm from Prince Edward Island. I represent the PEI Federation of Agriculture. I'm one of the growers that uh, grow potatoes, so I understand a little bit about potato wart and paperwork. And if it wasn't for the documentation we have, we wouldn't be having any discussion. So we, we know where our products come from. We know, where it's, we know where it is. We know what field it's grown in. Now, a lot of this is protected by the Privacy Act, but, re but regardless of that, some is documented. Somebody knows somewhere. And when you get... When you get in a crunch, it's important to have that. And I, 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 I only put a value on it when you have to look back. Whew, I'm so glad I kept that. So I'll, I'll just, you know, and I'm sure it's the same with Health Canada or what, what have you. It's, 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 it's protects us from liability. If you do not know where it's come from, you're liable for all the answers. So anyway, I, I'm gonna, as, as much as it is. Little sayings in life. I fear so much that we're going to die of thirst while we're sitting in, the, in, in a pond of water. We have all the, we have all the, uh, all the, we have the most fresh water of any country in the world. 
we have access to it, we have the arable land, we have the climate that's changing, we have access to tools that we're not able to use because of uh, democracy. So we can't, we, 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 we can't destroy that. Everybody has a say, but how do we, how do we educate ourselves and other, ourselves first so we can educate people to not be afraid to use the tools in science? We have technology. Unfortunate part of it is that technology is wonderful, but it's not dependable. And our technology fails, and we can't turn the machine on, it won't start. Prioritary rights. In, uh, uh, companies in the world build equipment, sell us the technology, and they have the prioritary rights to the programming, and something happens to them. That they have all kinds of problems. They have cyber attacks. They have just, you know, e internal issues. They can have a lot of money invested in some, uh, doing business in, the, in, in Russia, and all of a sudden you have sanctions, and they lose 80% of their sales. And so we, all, we, see, we see all these things that affect us and give us uncertainty. Then we have Mother Nature, um, uh, politics, and try to find the right answer. But like, I, I haven't said much here, but I, how can we get better numbers on nutrition that we're producing? Does it help us answer the question of how much fertilizer we need? How much money we have to spend to develop? One of the resolutions here today was to develop, you know, uh, more fertilizer production in on the eastern Canada. I guess you know. So I forget how it was worded, but I'm, you understand. I mean, I'm sure you, you you you're aware of that. So how can we put the real value of nutrition? So you talk about the millions of people in other countries that we're exporting product to. The ability for uh, the the, ability, the the opportunity we have for uh, genetically modified food, however you say that with, with a better word, uh, it just changes the the difference between the speed of oxen and the speed of light on being able to accomplish what you're after. That that's all it does. And and I'm afraid we 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 need more faster than we ever did before. And I, I'm, I'm sure we have the tools. But anyway, I, I'm not trying to sum up our meeting, but uh, I'm, I'm just, everything you talk about is important. But I think we need a few more values. Excuse me, a few more. We need some more equations on the value of our product, not just the price of it. I, I, I'm going to leave that with you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay. Sure, I'll tackle this one. No. <laughs> thank, thank you, sir. You, you, you covered a lot, a lot of areas. I, I know you're passionate about farming. That's, that's what, I, what I got out of what you said there is you've, you're so much, there's so much on your mind. You, you've got, you're, you're looking at all sorts of different angles. And um, I haven't even, I didn't even think about the nutrition, uh, are we using that as a metric of our, this product is more nutritional than, than others perhaps. But that's, that, uh, you know the 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 sales pitch or being an advocate for what we do, uh, how how great our products are. I think we can crank that up a lot more. And going back to what I asked the the prime minister on the value of agriculture in our society, that that that's on my mind. That that that's it's it's dwindling. Like we we don't put that a high enough value on what we all do, uh, our our colleagues do back in our home provinces. I'd like to see that, that shift so that we attract the next generation and they say, I'd like to be a farmer. Yeah, I want to be a farmer because I see what's going on here. They're doing great things. So, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm talking more high level and I apologize if I didn't get to any answer that you're looking for, but I, I think, I think there, there, isn't, there isn't exact one answer. It is more of a, a, a dialogue that we have to keep on uh, pushing and then government as our, our partner in this that, that has the funds and says we need to be investing in this. It is uh, for the greater good of all Can Canadians to make this strong investment. And, and, and at this uh, moment with the sustainable agric uh, agricultural strategy, it's, it's recognized that this is, this is gonna be a, an important thing to be looking at for many, many years of adapting to, to the, uh, what the current environment is. And, and, and I, 
uh, to touch on the on the whole paperwork thing, I, maybe I shouldn't have said that. And everybody's got all crazy about paperwork, but <laughs> but uh, but what I what I uh, uh, definitely definitely uh, uh, documenting and and safe food it, that's important to me. Like myself, my 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 family, my kids are eating the cherries, and I imagine on your farm, your families are eating that product. So so it, we're wanting to grow safe food. Mm -hmm. But the, the layering of the documentation of different retailers saying, well, I need you to, to do this, this, and this, and that guy's saying, well, you better do this as well. It's just a constant uh, tour of, of auditors coming through facilities and farms. That's the part of it that I think there could be some, uh, so, some work on consolidating that and saying this program is recognized as a, as a, a, a if it's, if it's a Canada Gap, a Global Gap, whatever it is, and perhaps they're equivalent, and that would save a lot of time. That was kind of what I was getting on, is not, not the back when it was, it's just get on the tractor and go for it and, and don't, uh, don't report to anybody. But we're not going back to those times, but, but I think bringing some sens sensibility to it that we just can't be spending all the time on, on doing audits, because and, and, growing safe food is, 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 in our, is in our DNA, that's what we want to be doing. Tom, do you want to jump in on Maybe any? If you don't mind, yeah, Karen, please. Well, just one on, um, uh, it's an interesting idea. I mean, we do, I mean, through StatsCan, our own economics group, we produce a lot of analysis and data, but we don't in any systematic way trans, uh, uh, monitor uh, the nutritional uh, content of, of the food. Uh, uh, I've seen, like, I think people will calculate estimates of how many people you can feed or how many calories you get out of, out of but, but it's an interesting concept and maybe something that we should... Uh, should pay closer attention to. I just maybe pick up on the on the other point that you know we talk about about different opinions about agriculture and and there are you know certainly in a trade context Canada through for many years has been an advocate of science based rules based international trade um, and you know sometimes we win that battle and sometimes not as fully as we'd like but there's also the consumer dimension where whatever the rules say in terms of accessing a market if a big part of the population says yeah i'd rather not buy a product that used that pesticide for example right that you can try to educate people when that view you, you feel that view isn't necessarily based in 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 science but you can only get so far and there's there's a need to be you know you, as we as people and consumers focus on sustainability, not all of the beliefs that are gonna form are gonna be rigorously based in science and what do you do when, when you don't? Do you try to explain to them why they're wrong or do you just sort of adapt your product to meet the needs of that market? And I think that's gonna be one of, the, one of the challenges that, I mean, that I think government and industry are gonna to have to collectively iterate through uh, in the coming years. And I'm thinking here, like I said, in largely about international markets. There's the, the rules that governments and the World Trade Organization and so on set standards for what you can do in terms of market access. But what if it's the, if it's a consumer as opposed to the, the government of the importing country saying, no thanks, I don't really want that product. Um, and, and, you know, and, and that, I mean, it has been a challenge for us in the past and I think it will be probably more of one going forward. Okay. Uh, we've got a couple of folks lined up at the mic, so uh, why don't you uh, introduce yourself and, and ask away. We're going to fight over who's next. <laughs> no. uh, it, it's a simple question, and here we are. To a, Canada's got lots of produce, lots of export, lots of things we can move offshore. In eastern Canada, we have a shortage of containers. And I say that on top of the fact that we have steel. We can make containers. We can print Canada on the side of those containers, and we can export. I know it's got to go to the U.S. to get on a major ship to get out of Canada, but we can, uh, if we had more containers, we'll wait three weeks for a container to load our product before we can get it out of Canada. And that's a disgrace to Canada. So we, and I know that the, the U.S. dominates the, mark, the market in containers, U.S. And, Canada, and China, but I think we can do more here in Canada with containers. Your comments? Yeah, no. Uh 100% agree. We, uh, well, at cherry industry, we, we use containers to ship our product. They're refrigerated containers, and, and yeah, they can be uh, very, uh, very sparse and, and not available. But, but that, you know, the, the, the lessons of, of COVID, that's what we should, have, should be learning. And, and we saw that with the PPE, that, it, that stuff was just not available. 
the solution is to do it yourself. Get it, if you ha you, you're doing it yourself, you know what's gonna be there. And, and under the leadership of the government, they need to be recognizing that if, if, if that segment, the container, call it segment, is not filling that, that's where government support and, and incentives to make that happen. Because yeah, you're 100% right. We've got all the, if you got all the produce, it's here, it's ready to go, and there's no containers, well, you know, then it was kind of all for nothing. Then, then it's flooding potentially the, the local market and prices, uh, uh, you know, our, our return is not going to be that great to the farmer. So, so yeah, the, it's, it's all working together with other industries to, to make sure the supply chain is there. And, and that's what needs to be brought to, to governments. Uh, we got Tom right here and he's taking, he's taking these notes and, and that's how we, this is the, the, the forum and, and how we bring that to, uh, uh, to, to the government's attention. I think we've got time for one more question. So, sir, you've got the, oh, I've got someone begging for a second question. So if, if we can do a 30 second, and we'll pretend we've got Justin Trudeau up here. 30 second question, <laughs> quick response, and we might be able to fit two in. So Chris ahead, McCall, sir. Ontario Federation of Agriculture. You're talking of challenges and opportunities. About 2% of Quebec is arable that they can grow food on. About less than 5% of the province of Ontario can, we can grow food on. My question is, at what point do we tell the politicians and the consumers that food should be a priority as opposed to industries and commercialization? We can't afford to keep losing our land at the rate we're losing it, and yet consumers and politicians fail to realize that food is the number one thing we need. You need food, shelter, and clothing to live. Without food, I don't care if I have a place to live or if I have clothes. I can't eat, I die. Mm -hmm. I, I think... It's a great question. I think we heard a, a bit about that yesterday as well, about how, you know, through COVID and, and through the, the last year, the, re, the focus has really been on, on food security. And I, I think more and more Canadians are starting to think about where their food is coming from, whether they've been on a farm or, or not. And, and I think raising that that importance with the consumer about the and, and educating about the Canadian agricultural sector is so key. But I don't know, Tom, if you've got sort of thoughts on on that from a not really, other than just my own experience is one thing that's great about working in the agri-food sector is everybody understands what it is you do, right, and how important it is. You don't have to, they may not fully understand where their food comes from and farming and so on, but the idea that, you know, as a society, we need a food system that functions for our society to function. Everybody understands that at some level, and, and it, it's, it's not that hard to get, to get people to understand that, even if they're, they're very far removed from, from the agricultural sector. Oh. I'll add, uh, coming from a province where we got the uh, agricultural land reserve, preserving farmland is definitely important. Another key element is preserving farmers, right? You, if, you're, if you don't do both of those, you're, it's not going to work out very well. So, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> the, so, but in, in the, my experience with BC is they, they put in that policy, but over time, it, it didn't, it, it didn't, it's, it's not about farming. It, it is just controlling the release if ag land is gonna come out of, out of this ALR. I, I heard that stat, I don't know if it was just in a discuss, or up here, about 300 or some acres of, of land in Ontario every day. But like, you know, my eye, you know, ears perked up and I'm like, per day, sorry, did I hear that correctly? So, so that, that worries me because if, if that is very fertile land that can grow crops, uh, then we're, we're already behind the, the planning that needs to, needs to take place to, to, to preserve that because uh, this, this topsoil stuff is not easy to, to produce. It, it takes a long, long time. So, so yeah, it's, uh, uh, we, we do need to be preserving the land, but the policies that support that uh, there just hasn't been a, a strong enough leadership to, to make that a priority that it's that it's that it's for farming, and that's that's what I've experienced, and and it, it is something that we need to really be focusing on if we want to have a, a continue to be a, a leader in, in agriculture. So one last one last question, sir. You're standing between this group and and the, the bar, beer. so yeah, so. yeah, I know. I and know. my been, flight, and my flight been, too. Andy. Been there, been there before. Andy Kaivin of Canadian Ornamental Horticulture Alliance. My farmers tell me real simply, your job as COHA is to get government out of the way so we can run our businesses. So I say back to them, that's fine and dandy, tell me what we need to get out of the way. 
So that's where I find a collaboration possibility between all of the sectors working together to say we need to solve this and really use a, a, a rifle approach of that's the problem, find a solution. So mine isn't so much of a question as a rant, which I'm known for. So that's what, that's what I think we as the whole community have to do. And the reason is, the reason really simply is because Canadian agriculture has potential. We have so much potential and we're not maximizing it because A, we as farmers might not be doing what we ought to do to maximize it because we're not thinking where we ought to think at times because we like to do things the way we did. That being said, government is in the way or government isn't supporting us in our ideas as we like. So my challenge to the panel to the CFA is let's continue to do what the CFA has been doing so well and that is capitalizing on the potential of Canadian agriculture by cooperating together and working hard with government to solve the issues that are at hand but let's make sure we find out our issues. Thank you. Well I think that is a great note to end on. <laughs> so. I think we've got no time left. Thank I want to thank my fellow panelists, and, and I want to thank everyone as well for sticking it out. I know last panel of the day, so um, and, and special thanks to the to the CFA for organizing this and inviting us uh, for the panel. So so thanks and. Thank you.